What are the top five reasons the UK economy will collapse? Energy shortages, workforce shortages, tax increases, living costs and lack of investment. But Adam, every country in Europe is affected by these five things. What is it that makes the UK so special? Everywhere you look, cost pressures are causing households and businesses to spend less. True, but the tax burden is particularly onerous for the middle classes in the UK. When you tax everyone, there's a higher unemployment and the velocity of money declines, which slows economic development right down. Meanwhile, the government always spends more than it collects in taxes. According to the Office for National Statistics, the UK economy is the only one of the G7 nations to have shrunk in the third quarter of 2022, and it's currently half a percentage point smaller than it was at the end of 2019 before lockdowns first started. As recently as February 2023, the Bank of England said we should expect inflation to fall quickly this year. Hilarious, it might be going down a little bit according to their flawed CPI data, but let's imagine they're telling the truth and inflation has dropped from 8% to 3%. Any inflation number above zero still means your money is losing purchasing power, just not at quite as rapid a rate as previously. Rate setters predicted that Britain's GDP would contract by around 1% between this year and the first quarter of 2024, making it the only G7 country to experience a recession in 2023. But why does it appear like the UK is doing worse than other developed countries like the USA, Germany and France. Keep watching as we go over the five reasons why the UK economy will collapse in today's video. Number one energy shortages. The UK is being thrashed by the European energy disaster brought on by the conflict in eastern Ukraine. The UK is more reliant on gas in general, but the European Union is more physically dependent upon supplies of Russian gas, and everybody is now paying higher prices for importing gas from overseas in the wake of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline destruction, which Liz Truss and Anthony Blinken carried out and blamed on Putin. And this is in spite of the government spending over $40 billion last year on reducing household energy bills. We're facing nothing less than utter catastrophe on every possible front. Now, we all know that CPI is essentially meaningless because it has no standardized unit of measure. You would never measure your own height with a shrinking ruler, yet apparently it's fine for unitless CPI to be accepted as a benchmark for measuring inflation and just substituting items into the basket whose prices never change to make it appear as though most prices aren't rising. Crazy! But even if we allow ourselves to believe for a moment that CPI isn't worthless, we discover quite quickly that the UK has seen the highest increases in prices across the G7 since the start of the pandemic, and that this includes food and energy prices with core inflation the highest of all G7 economies in March 2023 and only getting worse since then. Number two, workforce shortages. Although the UK's economy is weak and has become poorer in recent years, the country is still being held back further by substantial labour supply issues. Doctors warn that cancer patients face life-threatening delays due to a lack of radiographers at up to 97% of treatment centres. Fewer doctors are graduating than ever before, with the government refusing to fund extra training places for homegrown students. But you can immigrate into the UK with a skilled visa since medicine and pharmacology are on the list of in-demand jobs in the UK, with more of those workers being needed. The problem there is we're taking skilled people from other countries, stopping them from developing and stripping their home countries of essential services. You might say, well, there's more opportunity in the UK, so that's why they moved to the UK. That may have been true in the past, but today, many top workers are leaving the UK. Medicine isn't the only deserted field. 40,000 teachers left the workforce in 2022. During the pandemic, the workforce started to shrink in the majority of economies. Nonetheless, the UK continues to stand out as an exception because of how many boomers took early retirement and never worked again afterwards. The lack of European Union labour does not appear to be the only factor. Staff shortages have caused many small businesses to close their doors for good. Young individuals are choosing to pursue permanent education over employment, but they never feature in unemployment statistics. If they did, it would be clear how few people actually contribute to the economy of this godforsaken island at all. Elderly people are taking early retirement, and more people are claiming long-term sickness benefits than ever before. There are indications that the labour force may be beginning to expand slightly once again, which might assist to enhance GDP and tax receipts in the future. Number three, tax rises. It is well understood that there is an inverse correlation between tax levels and economic growth. 
If you want to increase taxes, that's fine to a point, but it does slow down economic activity. What's the point in working extra if the government confiscates your earnings? As interest rates continue to climb, interest payments on government debt get bigger and bigger and bigger. Taxes then rise to compensate for any shortfall, which further restricts how much money is left in people's pockets to spend in the economy or to start businesses of their own. It also means that the government and private sector are always competing with each other for capital, and the government always wins since they have a monopoly on force and violence. It always wins, that is, until it cannot extract any more money from its citizens and cannot sustain its spending any longer. At this point, it dies by its own hand. The only question is when. This is true of all empires throughout history. Now that the US debt burden has exceeded $33 trillion, an awful lot of interest needs to be paid each year to service that debt and it comes from taxpayers. The structure of the UK tax system is bureaucratic, convoluted and corrupt. People may think they're being magnanimous by paying off their rising taxes constantly, but all that happens is that the government uses the money you pay them as collateral with which to borrow more money and then they employ more people in government, very few of which actually produce anything. The government rarely improves basic services and they never retire any debt. Each year, government spends more than it takes in in taxes and that has been the case every year without exception going back to around 6000 BC. We're now at a point of a sovereign debt crisis which is bringing this country and others to its knees. The highest tax rate in the UK is 45%. The Bank of England is attempting to cure inflation by macroeconomic means by raising interest rates to encourage individuals to spend less rather than more. But inflation won't go down because inflation always rises during times of war and conflict and supply chain disruptions. And of course, the war in Ukraine is still raging with Zelensky canceling elections to continue the conflict with Russia until World War III is well and truly underway. Meanwhile, in the UK, all that increasing the interest rates is doing is making making people's lives harder by raising the prices of essential goods and driving more and more lower income households into endless credit card debt. Interest rates have increased seven times since December and true inflation is probably closer to 30% at the moment. Any official government statistics claiming that inflation is lower at say between five and 10% must immediately be dismissed as utter hogwash. Number four, cost of living. It is estimated that thanks to the recent interest rate increases, many households are spending up to 30% of their monthly income on housing costs. This is as high as 80% for many London residents, leading many to question the long-term sustainability of even obtaining shelter in this country as a young person, unless you're an asylum seeker. Jeremy Hunt says that he backs further interest rate rises by the Bank of England if inflation fails to come down. So if inflation doesn't come down, he wants interest rates to go up. Meanwhile, rising interest rates are making inflation worse. Hunt might as well say, if this fire doesn't go out soon, I'll have no choice but to pour massive quantities of lighter fluid all over it. Costs of living will continue to rise as interest rates continue to rise and as inflation continues to rise. You probably heard about Sunak trying to impose price controls at supermarkets for basic goods. Price controls distort markets and have the opposite effect to what the government intends. They intend, apparently, to bring prices down for consumers and in doing so, to win election votes. However, capping prices encourages companies to produce less of a product while making it more attractive to consumers. Supply goes down and demand goes up, with shortages being the inevitable result. Welcome to Great Britain, where only the stupidest morons ever get close to the levers of power. And when they do, they send £4.6 billion to Ukraine, which is easily one of the most corrupt countries in the history of the earth. People are really struggling with inflation being as high as it is. Rishi Sunak has set a goal to cut the inflation rate in half, which I think means that only 50 out of 100 of Boris Johnson's blow-up dolls will be fully operational. Apparently, the yearly rise in consumer prices is anticipated to decelerate this year. But inflation is sticky and prices are never going back to what they were in 2020. The cost of living is still growing and politicians of all parties are directly responsible, and in particular Sunak, for printing £840 billion of currency overnight, like only a monstrous psychopath can. Everybody's sterling denominated savings, past, present and future, immediately became cursed at that very moment. Number five, investment. 
Entrepreneurs will only invest if there is a compelling case for doing so. Employment levels, educational attainment, training opportunities and taxation all have an impact on how much money firms choose to invest in manufacturing, employment, infrastructure and innovation. A lack of investment ultimately results in a less productive and less efficient economy. But where, how and why an entrepreneur invests is sector dependent. It has been revealed that over 40% of UK hospitality businesses are operating at a loss. And why is that? Well, let's think about the costs involved in operating a hospitality business. Let's say you run a restaurant or a coffee shop. You have to rent a building or a retail space. Rent is an ongoing monthly fixed cost, which in many cases has gone up since 2020. You have to buy or rent the equipment and furnishings. You have to pay for water and broadband. You must pay staff costs, and we know minimum wages have gone up in the UK. You have to pay public liability insurance to operate your business. You may have to pay for an alcohol or pavement or live performance license. Each one of these things can cost thousands of pounds per year. Meanwhile, your customer base is declining because people have less discretionary spending power than before COVID. So in our example, if you own a coffee shop, you have to buy the stock, which is more expensive now. You have to pay for unused wasted stock, repairs to the premises, cleaning services, laundry, alarms and security at the premises, staff training and development costs, equipment servicing, commercial waste collection, council tax, computers or point of sale equipment, accountancy software or accountancy fees. And separately from that, there is payroll tax for every single person you employ constantly forever until they leave or are replaced by somebody else that you also have to pay payroll taxes for. There is also VAT levied at 20% in the UK on everything that you sell over 85,000 pounds. You also have to pay pensions to your workers unless they sign zero hours contracts, which many will refuse to do. You have to grapple with the steep and growing energy costs as well. So high monthly energy bills, both electricity and gas, they'll probably introduce some kind of carbon tax nonsense. If for instance, you sell meat or burn wood in a log burner, your organization's carbon footprint will be measured and you'll be charged vast sums if your energy usage exceeds a certain threshold. And then if there is any money left at the end of this assault, Sold, you have to pay corporation tax at 25% and capital gains tax when you sell the business. And you also don't know if or when another lockdown will be imposed and your business will be forced shut. Knowing all this, it's hardly surprising that the Insolvency Service reported that in December last year, there were 1,964 company insolvencies in England and Wales, 32% higher than the previous year and 76% higher than pre-pandemic numbers. Given all the insane taxes, you'd be better off starting your retail company in a country with a relatively youthful population and a warmer climate in which citizens are treated fairly and with dignity by their government like Afghanistan, for instance. The UK economy, according to Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, is robust. It's about as robust as Matt Hancock's marriage. Hunt said, the results indicated underlying strength, but added that the economy was not out of the woods. Of course he used the phrase, not out of the woods. A fitting expression, given the number of doggers in the Conservative Party. To sum up, ignore everything they tell you, it's nonsense. None of these people know anything, they're all idiots. Is the UK falling behind? Well, apart from street roaming psychos, bursting prisons, a lost education system, a female Gestapo police force, face nappies like it's a fashion trend, taxing earnings at 60% while inflation parties at 30%, constant price and tax hikes, NATO's let's provoke Russia strategy, forced business closures, questionable medical procedures, and queuing up behind 10 million for healthcare, it's a paradise. Couldn't recommend it more. Seriously though, data says other countries tackled problems better than the UK. Our economy is crawling along like a sloth on sedatives, weighed down by Sunak's 840 billion pound borrowing bonanza. Debt is crushing us, innovation's MIA. And admitting our troubles? Nope, the government will manage our decline into third world country status before admitting error. The UK is the only rich country smaller and poorer post pandemic. Elective surgeries, seven million waiting. Docs, ghosted. New folks moving in, yes, half a mil yearly, but houses, none. Jobs, sure, but retirees and long term sicknesses, sore. Next election is just going to be about picking which psychopath rams the iceberg. But let's be serious for a moment. The available data indicates that other nations have been affected by the problems of recent years less severely than the UK has. We've had four prime ministers in as many years. 
Each of these has made the country poorer, weaker, and more stupid than ever before. Once they leave office, they tour the world, giving speeches or selling books, raking in millions of pounds in the process. Also, they have to be protected for the rest of their lives by private security teams, and this is rumoured to cost taxpayers tens of millions of pounds each and every year. This system is not working, and it wouldn't be improved by switching the political affiliation of the country's leadership. The problem is politics itself. They get into power by promising you money that can only be delivered to you by first stealing it from other voters and from unborn children. It's an endless game of pass the parcel, except when the music stops, the person has to be injected with poisons before she can unwrap the next layer. She's about to unwrap the final layer and then passes out, moments before she would have discovered that she was handling a gift-wrapped cow pad.